Sabathun's throne world. This is an uncharted wonderland of secrets and lies. It's this place that she's created in her own image, this surreal and majestic light-blessed world. She has this castle that she rules from. It overlooks this dark, swampy underbelly with this lone pyramid ship out there. It's the future world she wanted to create, built atop the darkness that she left behind. Welcome back Guardians. Today I'd like to go over the topic of throne worlds. Since Savathun's throne is of course the new destination coming in Witch Queen, I thought going over what we know about throne worlds might help us understand what exactly we're getting into. I'll also be discussing the nature of hive worms and their pact with the hive, as well as a little information on the nature of the ascendant plane. By the time you get to the end of this video, you may also come to the same conclusion as me, and that is, Savathun's throne world will be maintained using the light, because without her worm, her throne world should no longer exist. If true, Savathun may be the first to use the light to maintain a throne world. You can find me each and every day over on Twitch. If you want to watch live, a link will be in the description. And with that, let's get into it. So what is a throne world? To summarize, a throne world is essentially a bubble in the ascendant plane that manifests when an individual becomes extremely powerful. There are exceptions to this rule which I'll cover shortly. While the throne exists, whenever its owner is killed, they simply get sent back to the throne world instead of dying. However, if the individual is killed while inside their throne, the throne is destroyed and they are dead for good. Throne worlds are mostly associated with the Hive and the Worm Gods, with the earliest throne we know of belonging to Oryx the Taken King, or Oryx as he was previously named. After being betrayed and killed by his sister Savathun, Oryx awoke in his throne world. The concept was then explained to him by the Worm Gods. Have a listen to the weakness verse from the Books of Sorrow. You are dead, young Oryx, betrayed and murdered by your own sister for the crime of mercy. Remember what you said to the Ammonite Satellite Congress. We will parlay on neutral ground. Savathun's witches have rendered it utterly neutral. No living thing will ever claim it again. Your body is gone, but you have endured. Safe in the cyst universe created by your own might. Your throne world. From this day forward, Oryx, you and your sisters will each survive death, so long as you aren't killed in your own throne. Something that becomes immediately clear is that Oryx wasn't, or at least consciously, responsible for the creation of his throne world, as it exists before he was even aware of the concept. However, this doesn't mean that throne worlds just pop up once an individual becomes strong enough, and to better understand this, let's talk about the worms. As a brief refresher, hive worms are the larvae of the worm gods, enormous paracausal creatures that the hive siblings met in the depths of the fundament. A pact was made in which the hive would be granted immense power and immortality upon consuming the larvae, but only as long as they continued to feed their worm with death and destruction. The more a worm is fed, the more powerful it, and by extension its host, becomes. Okay, back on topic, as mentioned earlier, the creation of throne worlds can't be tied to strength alone, or else there would be many, many thrones out there, most notably among powerful guardians. So the hive must have something the rest of us don't in order to maintain their thrones, the most obvious culprit being the worms. We're even told in the books of Sorrow that Oryx, Savathun, and Zivu's worms are partially responsible for the creation of their throne worlds. Have a listen to the entry and incision in which the hive gods begin to explore and understand their thrones. It reads, Three kingdoms grew swollen in the sword space. They were the gaze and glory of Oryx, the cunning and knowledge of Savathun, the triumph and brawn of Zivurath. These kingdoms were created from the minds and worms of our lords. Saith Oryx, this is where I went when I died. Let us establish our thrones here, for I am Oryx, the first navigator, and I shall chart death, and my throne shall be carved of Osmian. It's important to note that only the most exceptionally powerful hive have throne worlds, even the daughters of Oryx, despite being older than Crota, did not have their own thrones, as they died on the dreadnought, Oryx's throne, during the King's Fall Raid. So, in the case of the Hive, it would seem that only the most excessively fed worms are powerful enough to manifest a Hive throne world. Before moving on, let's briefly address a couple of outliers that sit outside of this idea that the worms are required for a throne world. 
First and foremost, we have Mara Solve and her Throne World of Eleusinia, also known as the Shattered Throne. Mara is different from the Hive Gods in that she consciously and deliberately built her throne with the help of Riven, an Ahamkara, and her Tekians. Have a listen to the lore entry, Throne. It reads, Ilin made tincture after tincture of queen's foil to her clothes stank and her hands were stained reddish black. Open eyed, she walked between planes and sorted the threads of reality on a vast metaphysical loom, weaving some closer, some more distant. Mara and Riven shaped her third throne together, and the artistry of their work was a testament to the hungry joy they felt in that partnership. They named it Eleusinia, and it was in those ascendant halls that Mara finally carved a statue for sure. While Ahamkara wishes are capable of many things, and perhaps that's all there is to Eleusinia, but it is interesting to note a key similarity between Mara's throne and those of the Hive Gods. Both were created through the packs with an innately paracausal being. In Mara's case, it was Riven, and in the Hive's case, it was the Worms. So perhaps paracausality is required in order to construct a throne world. If this is the case though, why hasn't a Guardian used the light? Is it as simple as we don't need throne worlds because we have ghosts? Or maybe throne worlds are just darkness versions of ghosts? Regardless, moving along, another outlier is the Mindbender who built a throne world out of Cade's death during the Forsaken campaign. While it pales in comparison to those of Mara or the Hive Gods, it is a throne world nonetheless. Hyrax was obsessed with the Hive and their sword logic, seeking ways to harness it for himself. Throughout the Brood Hold Strike, we see that before his death, the Mindbender was experimenting on Hive Worms by infusing them with ether. so maybe the Worms were also essential for Hyrax's throne world. The third and final anomaly is Toland. While not explicitly referred to as a throne world, Toland does have his own little space in the Ascendant Plane. We know this because Mara stumbles upon it while on her journey from Oryx's throne world back to Elysinia after the event of the Taken King. Have a listen to the Reverie Dawn Gloves lore tab. It reads, He tries to speak to her from a place of high contempt. In doing so, he invites her into his topography. She steps out of howling and finds her footing upon a plane of swords and madness and all-consuming curiosity. Who are you? The question summons an almost forgotten answer deep within the rapidly solidifying shape of her. I am Marasov. Starlight was my mother, and my father was the dark. The thing that was once called Toland flees before her darkness, light, shadow, majesty, and she rests within this scrap of world before resuming her journey through the Howling. Of course, Tolan is, or at least was, a Guardian, so he's got the paracausality covered. However, that can't be all there is to a throne world, or once again, Guardians would have their own thrones, no problem. That being said, people have speculated in the past that our ghosts is a kind of throne world, returning us from death. While all these characters leverage some source of paracausality, whether it's the worms, the Ahamkara, hive worms mixed with ether, there is another component. And this seems to be the secret source. And it's really simple. Sheer will, power, and desire. For the longest time, we assumed the Ascendant Plane was a realm dictated by the sword logic. However, thanks to new information from Season of the Lost, we now know this not to be the case. Petra describes the Ascendant Plane as the backstage of the universe sculpted by willpower and imagination. We also get some information from Mara that takes us back to an earlier note about paracausality. Have a listen to this Forest of Echoes data cache from the Shattered Realm activity. This cache contains planar telemetry about an attempted breach of the Ascendant Plane from somewhere else. The paracausal can influence this place with thought, tie two ends of our world together with their willpower. Something ruptured this space with the power of its desire alone. As you can see, it's not just about being powerful or tapping into some source of paracausality, such as the worms or Ahamkara or even the light, but there is an element of sheer willpower and desire. And this, of course, is why throne worlds suit these characters like Mara, Oryx, Savathun. The throne worlds are reflections and manifestations of who these characters are. While power causality is not the only thing required for a throne world, it does appear to be a necessary component. 
This makes Witch Queen super interesting because if we are successful in removing Savathun's worm, removing her source of power causality, that means she's maintaining her throne world using the light. Which thematically would make a lot of sense considering how her throne world has this giant white castle. And like the developers said, it has been blessed in the light. I think it would be reasonable to say that if Savathun's worm is removed, that she would need to draw upon the energy of the light to sculpt and maintain her throne world in the absence of her worm. If that is the case, Savathun could potentially pave the way for a guardian throne world. What further supports this idea that Savathun needs to replace the worm with the light in order to maintain and continue her throne world is actually hinted at by Mara Sof. Because Mara believes that without the worm, Savathun would not be protected by her throne world. Of course, Marasov in game has not seen the marketing material for Witch Queen and has no idea that Savathun is about to steal the light. Have a listen to the Wayfinder's Voyage dialogue this season. She offered me a bargain. If I exercise her worm, she will release Osiris and help us defeat the Black Fleet. I recognize the risk. Her inevitable betrayal is all but a guarantee. But without her worm, Savathun is vulnerable. Unprotected by the security of her throne world, mortal. So here is how I put all this information together to make a prediction for Witch Queen. Savathun relies upon the power causality of a worm to craft, build and maintain a throne world. Of course, she has a healthy dose of sheer willpower and desire to achieve this. Mara thinks that Savathun will lose access to a throne when they remove her worm, making Savathun mortal and vulnerable. Savathun plans on replacing the worm with the light so that she can continue to maintain, build, access her throne world. And so it is possible that the Witch Queen will likely provide the best example of a throne world maintained and crafted by the light. This is pretty scary considering Savathun also has a hive ghost. What happens when you have both a ghost and a throne world? And with that, that concludes this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. If you'd like to support the channel and cannot think of a comment, you can leave the words throne world. As usual, it's been a pleasure. This is Marlin Games. Peace.